Welcome, everybody, and um, that was our Kenny. We all have Kenny stories, don't we? It's my job to welcome you to Village Chapel, and uh, thank you for being here today. And also say welcome to the numbers. I'm not sure what the number is right now, but we've got a, a ton of people watching right now on the uh, live streaming uh, version of this. Some music coming up for you in a little while, a lot of Kenny music, a lot of Kenny pictures, a lot of Kenny memories, and meet some of the family as well. Something I was very um, pleased to see, Jackie Patillo from the Gospel Music Association, President and Executive Director, uh, brought this in today, and it'll be on display a little bit after. And it is a, a resolution of respect for Kenny Marks, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing because the font's too small. But whereas uh, Kenny went on to, I'm just going to read a couple of them, went on to inspire audiences around the world, performing in venues in six continents over his musical career. As the gospel music joins with the entire CCM community, expressing it, um, heartfelt condolences to the family of Kenny Marks. 
Be it resolved, we will forever remember the great contribution of Kenny Marks and that he had for generations to come. His talent and spirit will live on through the inspiration he brought to the world through his innovative artistry. That's a wonderful thing, and it's a, it's a special guy that this is about. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that, doesn't, that didn't know Kenny, but maybe you didn't know him as well as you thought you did. And again, as I say, we all have our stories. So sit back and enjoy what's about to happen. To get things started, um, a contemporary of, of Kenny's, Rick Kua, we've asked him to come up and, and uh, lead an opening prayer. Good afternoon. So the word says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived that which God has prepared for those who love him. Kenny Marks loved God, and he loved us. The two greatest commandments, he was such an example of that, and so important in our lives, Diana and I and everyone in this room, uh, whether you knew him intimately as a, as a close friend or whether you just admired his music, Kenny, I know at this moment, is delighted. And I won't say he would have loved this. I will say Kenny loves this because he has gone from life to life. And being in heaven, being with Jesus is something that we can't conceive with our natural minds. But I believe there's a dimension here and Kenny is experiencing this with us. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful that we are here to celebrate a great man, a great friend, a great musician, a great communicator, Kenny Marks. God, we thank you that we can come together now and just reminisce through what's going to happen over the next little while during this service and, again, be grateful that we know this man. Lord, I pray a blessing over every family represented today, and I thank you that your word says Kenny has been swallowed up by life. And that's what we're going to hang on to. That's where our faith is, and that's where Kenny's faith is. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Kathleen Marks German, the youngest sister, and this is Karen Rockovich, the eldest. We are reading John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Be, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say, love Kenny Marks, love his spirit, sense of humor, and that always smiling face. I was very fortunate to have Kenny record a few of my songs through the years, and, <clears throat> and this one in particular that we're going to do, uh, it was a very special song for me. Uh, Bubba originally asked me, would you sing this song and for Kenny's uh, service? And I said, no, <laughs> not even. There's going to be a room full of great singers here, and, and uh, wouldn't even think about it. So I got one of the best singers we can, we can find, Chris Rodriguez. He's going to sing the song we wrote.
I've never been a wealthy man Own boats and planes, lots of land But if I did, you know I'd plan To give it all to you I've never been able to buy all the stars in the sky But if I did You know that I'd give it all to you I'd give you all, all you see Even though there's not much to me all I ever hope to be is everything to you. I give you all, all I've got, even though there's not a lot. All I am, all I'm not, I give it. I give it all to you If I could turn it back through time And gather all I once called mine I know today that you would find it all belongs to you. If I should ever be a king of the world and everything, you know I'd still would be my dream to give it all to you. Hey guys, Keith Thomas here, and I am so sorry I can't be with you today to honor and celebrate the life of our dear friend, Kenny Marks. I met Kenny in the early 80s. Neil Joseph was creating a sample project for Word Records, and whoever got the best response would end up with a recording contract, and that just happened to be Kenny. Kenny and I would go on to do two more albums together, and little did we know that we were building a bond and a friendship that would last well over three decades. I want to express my condolences to the family and to Pam and the kids. And I want to thank each of you for being here today to remember Kenny Marks. Hi, everybody. Rob Frazier here. Carol and I are so sorry to be missing Kenny's service today, but she's away on family business, and I am teaching an all-day college class out at Williamson College in Franklin, where I'm adjunct faculty. But if I know Kenny at all, I know that he would never want me to miss a paying gig just to come to his service. 
Well, I first met Kenny Marks way back in 1971 when he came to play at my high school church youth group in suburban Philadelphia with George King in the fellowship. And I remember being really impressed with him, this guy with this cool guild 12 string strapped around his neck. And I remember saying to myself, man, I want to do what he's doing. And then all those years later when we had each made our way to Nashville pursuing music careers, we kind of connected and became friends and did some co-writing together for his projects. But we haven't really become good friends until the last 10 years where we've continued to write and this song that you're about to hear is one of the last songs that he wrote and that we wrote together and it's a song where he really makes peace with the past and is able to trace the finger of God in his long and eventful life and ministry so it's a song that we wrote together demo hoping that it would be on an upcoming project but it's really a song that comes from Kenny's heart
A great song with great memories of Kenny Marks, right? Well, this is your time, and the family would like to hear from you. And we're going to start it off and from, with our good friend Mike Rapp. So after Mike, we'd love to hear any memories you have of Kenny. Thanks, Bob. Some of you probably know me when I actually had hair. Um, I think Baba kind of, pardon me for taking notes, I wanted to make sure that I covered everything I wanted to say today. Um, Bubba asked me to kick things off in part because we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks talking about our friendship with Kenny, uh, but also because um, I realized that I've spent almost my entire career in the Christian music business working with Kenny Marks. So uh, I know Kenny's family is here today. My remarks are from someone who knew Kenny very well, and uh, we were very much in the trenches together when we worked together at Word Records. And I say that I worked with Kenny Marks because I had a phrase that I used for Kenny and I said that Kenny Marks was the hardest working man in Christian music. Um, he kind of thought that was cool. Um, but I meant it because we were prone to ask artists to do a lot of things uh, to help promote things, and uh, it's probably no surprise to you that artists don't always uh, like to do things to promote records, but Kenny Marks, um, not only did he never complain, uh, he always considered it a privilege. Um, I remember one time, I was just talking to Barry Landis, uh, I, um, I promoted, I think, every, almost every single that was released to radio, and I remember once asking Kenny to come in and write uh, a personal letter to every radio programmer. And Kenny asked me if I was going to be in tomorrow. Because Kenny planned to be in tomorrow to write 150 letters to radio programmers. And that's exactly what Kenny Marks did. Um, last week I had um, the privilege of calling uh, Wayne Watson, who um, was a label mate of Kenny's, uh, and giving him the news of Kenny's death. And um, he wanted to, me to express how devastated he is, was to learn of Kenny's death. And Kenny uh, was probably, probably couldn't have had anybody more opposite than Kenny than Wayne. And that wasn't really lost on Kenny. Um, Kenny would always say to me, you know, I'm not a great singer, and I'm not a great songwriter, and I'm not a great performer. But I do all three of those pretty well. And what I really do well is I work really hard. And I can tell from the smiles in the room that everybody feels the same way. Um, and I think that's probably why I related to Kenny. Um, Kenny just was never going to be outworked. And Kenny always felt like it was truly a calling. What he did was truly a calling on his life, and he took it really seriously. Kenny didn't write anything that wasn't serious to him. He, I remember, I was driving over here today, Bob, and I remember some of these songs that Kenny wrote, and he would write songs that got a lot of response. I mean, he would get letters back when people wrote letters. And I remember Kenny sitting in front of boxes of letters, just reading every word, and he was always so stunned and so appreciative of the response that people had to his music. And it was really not a surprise because Kenny always knew that people needed to hear these songs and he always knew he was the only one that was called to do it. So when he got a letter from a girl that was struggling in life, it deeply affected him. It deeply affected him. So, you know, I just want to say that, you know, I feel really privileged to be here today. Uh, Kenny, and, Kenny was an artist that was close to me personally, and I was also really lucky that Kenny considered me a friend, and we remained friends afterward, and um, I, for one, look forward to seeing him again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mike. Who else would like to say something? Some wonderful, funny story, memory, anything? Yes, thank you. Please say who you are. I'm David King. I am George King's brother, for those of you that know him. Um, the other guy at the high school with Bob Frazier doing the concert in 1971 was me. 
And, um, you know, we, we were at a time in Christian music where it was difficult to take drums and people like us showing up in boots and all that kind of stuff was, you know, Sunday mornings could be tough. But it was, um, it was actually during Kenny's, I'm going to give you a little of Kenny before Nashville. Um, we had a really strong ministry through West Virginia. That's where Kenny met Pam. Um, Kenny was with us for Clear and Free when we started. We did our first pilot of Clear and Free. And, you know, I, it was George and Kenny and myself, and Keith Lancaster was one of our partners. And um, um, I, I remember the first time I heard the sound of an acoustic guitar, I mean, with the 12-string, and um, the acoustic piano together. It was just beautiful. And he had, his tenor voice was about three notches higher when he was that age. But he was actually, I, uh, I had the uh, privilege of helping to put together the group GLAD. And it was really Kenny's, the tenor sound in his voice that was my inspiration for that stacked, um, that stacked male harmony. But, um, and then we were, we didn't talk for many years, but when George, when George went home to be with the Lord, um, as much as that was the Lord's will, we're not always happy with that. And I was grieving so hard about that. And I, and I reached, actually reached out to Kenny on the phone and on text. And, you know, he put up with me because I was so angry about losing George. And, you know, George was like my touchstone. And we did totally different. I was the, you know, the secular producer doing all this other stuff. And, but we, we, we were really close. And Kenny sort of just helped me cement that back together. But I um, am intensely glad that I knew him as a Christian brother. And you know, when you share the road together, it was almost three years. I mean, you just, you know, it's like being married to everybody, you know, and you just get close, you get close by default. And, um, you know, I'm just glad that we just had a great time together. And, you know, Kenny, now I will tell you, Kenny had a record before his first record. And it was the 45 that I produced for him. And the two songs, Pam knows this, the two songs were Sing High, that was a, was a, um, Come on, Pete, what's the, um, e, um, Murray, Ann Murray song. And then on the back, Kenny was a very brave person, and it hadn't been out very long. He did, I Shall Be Released by Bob Dylan. So we had worked, you know, when you work, those of you that work with Kenny, Kenny's got his own ideas. So we put all these arrangements together. We practiced really hard because, you know, we had $1.95 to do this 45 that, you know, he wanted the, co the, wanted the label to look like the Coke cap, so I did that. Anyway, so... You know how Kenny, you all know that Kenny can throw you a left turn. So I show up at the studio, and Kenny shows up with a steel player. Now, I'm in contemporary Christian music, and I've never, I didn't know how steel guitar worked, but he wanted this thing, and it got in there, and I was listening to it the other day, and it's a little clumsy, but he wanted that steel player in there, and he just rammed that thing away. But anyway, I, <laughs> oh, I was honored to do that. Anyway, thank you. David, thank you. Thank you, David King. Thank you. That was a great memory. There's a, there's a great legacy right there. Who else would like to say something? Anybody else? Yes, Doug Dimmel. Doug, say something. Doug Dimmel, I was in his, where do you want me? I was a remarkable for two years back in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, I'll never forget, I auditioned with Neil Joseph to play in this tour they called Just What You're Looking For. And Kenny, Wayne Watson, Terry Desario. And I'll never forget the first rehearsal. His first song, by the end of it, he, his back was bust, broken out in a full sweat, and he broke two strings on his guitar. <laughs> and uh, I know George Caccini and I looked at each other, and George says, this guy's intense. And then we get on the tour bus, and the tour bus has got the three artists sitting on one side of the row, and we're on the other, and pretty soon Kenny says, all right, let's figure out who's going to go first on the show. And Wayne and Terry look kind of dumbfounded, and Kenny said, here's what I'll do. I'll go first. Terry's in the second because she's a female, and Wayne, you wrap it up. And he said, but I got one issue. I, we take an intermission right after I'm done. <laughs> and he said, it was when his set was over, he 
with guitar around his neck. He said, I'll see you at the product table. And it was like the Red Sea folding back in on the Egyptian army. And there you go. Doug, you, you nailed Kenny, right? <laughs> Doug Demmel. Thank you, Doug. Who else? Anybody else? This is it. This is your opportunity. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, Rick, you got one? Got go, Rick. Yeah. So uh, Kenny knew how to do things. Diana and I moved here from upstate New York in, what, 34 years ago. Pam and Kenny were one of the first couples uh, that welcomed us to a party at their house. It was a beach party. They actually put sand on the ground, on the hardwood. And I thought, man, where are we? What is going on? <laughs> But anyway, Kenny would tell me when I came from secular music into Christian music, he kind of encouraged me a lot, and he almost mentored and tutored me a little bit. And he said, Rick, whenever the phone rings, first thing, you pick it up every time, you know, because he would get gigs. And then he started introducing me to different people that, you know, one guy that had a place in Columbus, Joe White at the Canuck camp, and different people, and everything he did for me was it was magical. It worked. It was wonderful. I came home. We paid the rent. It was all of that. And I'm thinking, man, this Kenny, he's, he's really helping me out. And so then one day I was having a hard time with all my gear getting it to the airport. And I said, Kenny, what do you, what do, you do with all your gear? And he says, Rick, I got a truck. And I'm thinking, you got a truck? I, I, I never had a truck. So I'm thinking, this guy hasn't made a mistake yet. So one Saturday morning I woke up. I told Diana, I said, come on, honey, get dressed. We got, I got a little errand to do. So she gets dressed, and we go to the truck store. <laughs> and I buy a truck just like Kenny's truck. It was the same color. It was the same kind. Diana's in shock. Now she's thinking. And I said, no, honey, this is going to be good. Don't worry. It's going to be good. And on the way home, we stopped at the Kroger. We got about 15 bags of groceries. And she said, where are you going to put them? And I uh, will just to put them in the back of the truck. And she's looking at me with this weird look, and I'm thinking, no, no, Kenny knows what he's doing. <laughs> I got the truck. And we drove home. By the time I got home, there was groceries all over the back of that truck, broken eggs. It was unbelievable. So I had that truck about five minutes. So Kenny, on all counts but the truck, <laughs> right on. Good job. Great story, Rick. Thank you. So it was, it was red? It was red like Kenny's. Anybody else want to say something? Yes, Neil. Neil Joseph in the back here. Come on up, Neil. Thanks, Bub. Well, um, so it was 1980, I think, and I was a young A&R guy who just started at Word Records. Uh, had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but the one good decision I made was to sign my very first artist and that was Kenny Marks. And uh, it was uh, an amazing journey with him. We uh, made a lot of music together, uh, had a lot of fun together, spent a lot of time in the studio together, uh, did a crazy tour. Doug Demo, I haven't seen you in 100 years. Great to see you, brother. Um, but Kenny was an infectious guy. We all know that. And uh, he had tons of energy, and he challenged me all the time. Uh, you know, Mike Rapp, you said, uh, I, I remember you saying that he's the hardest working man in Christian music, and, and he absolutely was. And he set a standard high, and I think he drew the best out of a lot of us. So uh, he'll be missing, as has, has been said, um, you know, the party's not over for him. It's just beginning. So praise God for Kenny Marks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Neil. I wouldn't have a career without Neil Joseph. Thank you, Neil. Anybody else? Yes. Can you come this way, please? Oh, hey, Lois. And say your name. Oh, I'm Lois Stone, and um, I've known Kenny since the 80s when we were in a dinner group together with John and Marty Coates and um, the two of us, and I forget who the other, fam other couple was, but we sort of clicked, and we started, started a tradition of getting together after that. Well, um, I saw his scarf, and I'm like, what's with the scarf? And how do you get it to look like so neat and everything? He took the time to take it off, show me how to fold it, and I've never forgotten it. And I still have those scarves, and they said on them, be sharp. They had the, the treble clef with the notes, 
uh, and the uh, signature and everything, and it, and that was his uh, kind of his signature thing. But that that meant a lot to me that, you know, I was a nobody. I wasn't in, in music, or he didn't have to be friends with us. But he did. He and we stayed friends all these years until I used to pop in at his house down in Columbia and see him whenever I happened to be down that way. Um, so he, as you all know, he was a great guy. Thank you, Lois. Anybody else? Otherwise, we'll move on. One more? Yes? Please, this way. All right, I was not going to tell the story. Tell us who you are. And Karen, sorry about this. Uh, my name is Steve Still. I grew up with Kenny. He was my boyhood best friend. We had sisters, so I suddenly had a brother. So from fifth grade on, he was the best man at my uh, wedding. But the, the important thing was that I was part of his first two recordings. The first one was in the basement of Kenny's house on Custer, and Mike had, had a, this old webcore recorder, right? I had an old guitar. Kenny didn't have a guitar, but he had a mandolin. And it had no strings. <laughs> but he banged on that thing, we played, just, it was ridiculous. And of course, later he found out that it was his mandolin, the Gibson. And he still, I think he still has that mandolin. Until, yeah, it was your mother's mandolin. And it was a valuable thing. The second one, <clears throat> we played together. We played folk music back in the day, in the 60s. And uh, we had a friend who played bass, you know, a big string bass. But we didn't have one. And so we were scheduled to play at a at a high school hootenanny or whatever it was called back then. And so it seemed like we were kind of stuck. So we're going to both play guitars. I played a little banjo. We we're going to do what we could. And then suddenly he had a fabulous idea. He said, I know where we can get one. And he was in, in band in high school. And he said, let's just take one from the school. <laughs> so I had my Volkswagen. And we, I pulled up and back, and he, he walked out the door with this big, not a case, just the, the instrument. We threw it in the car, and then we practiced with it for two weeks, and then played at the school with a stolen bass. <laughs> and I still have that tape of that performance. So, and the Royal Oak Police called, and that was the end of it. <laughs> the Royal Oak, thank you so much. Hey guys, thank you all for your memories. We're gonna continue, thank you so much. My name's Mark Cheshire. Um, I was told to say that. <laughs> I, I got to know Kenny because of this song. Um, I had been in Nashville just for a few years uh, when I got a call from Bubba, I think it was, um, said, hey, we really like your song. We're going to cut it. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And I cannot believe what happened with it, with uh, Kenny. He did justice to it. And... Uh, I'm sure he's really surprised that I'm sitting up here right now <laughs> doing it for him. Every boy wants a girl Every girl wants a boy All around this old world It goes on and on and on Searching for that perfect touch you find someone, but they ask for too much. Every girl needs some love. Every boy needs some too. But no one's willing to give theirs up. It goes on and on and on. You can't love until you know the truth That there's somebody who has seen 
in love through so who make it right fall in love with Jesus tonight make it right fall in love with Jesus tonight You want the passion, you want the fire You want the romance, you've got the desire and Then the flame starts to die And you move on and on and on When will you learn that it's more than a kiss? When love has come, why do you still resist? So make it right. Fall in love with Jesus tonight. Make it right. Fall in love with Jesus tonight. Oh, make it right. Fall in love with Jesus tonight. Make it right. Fall in love with Jesus tonight. Hi, this is Steven Yank. Wishing I was with you guys right now. But I'm currently in Corinth, Greece, where, as you know, the book of Corinthians, books of Corinthians, were written by Paul to the people who lived in this town. Kenny Marks, what a man. We're all still blown away by his death. Kenny and I go back 30 some years. We've traveled the world together, shot six music videos, including one in Red Square, and Soviet Union. We hung out a lot. We were polar opposites when it came to the politics. But you know what? We always agreed to disagree. And somehow we made that work because we were just friends and we enjoyed being with each other. I was asked to tell some stories about Kenny and I. And boy, I thought of some, <laughs> and I thought of some better not tell but the thing that I thought about more than anything about Kenny was his passion he wrote with a passion he sang with a passion and his heart his heart was always right there and the scripture verse that was just burning in him for the last several years was 1st Corinthians 13 12 for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part but then shall I know, even as also I am known. That was Kenny. So anybody who would listen, he would read that verse and say, man, that is so intriguing to me. Just to think, what is on the other side of that glass? I had lunch with him a couple weeks ago. I was uh, recruiting him or signing him up to be in a TV taping that we do called Remember the Music, the CCM United thing that many of you know about. We're doing another one in February. And he was going to do that. And I said, well, we're going to interview you and talk about your career. And all he goes, wait, I want to talk about 1 Corinthians 13, 12 and explain what that means to me and how that's driven my ministry. Because every one of us sees through that glass darkly. But if we receive Christ, we'll see everything. Well, right now, Kenny Marks, you're seen on the other side of that glass. The curtain has pulled you are known as we as you are you're seeing it all and man we rejoice for that we miss you but we're gonna see you again buddy i love you rest in peace and remember the party's never over
Well, y'all have gotten old. So wild to be here and not have seen so many of you. It's really a joy, isn't it, to get together, even though it's this odd reason, but we're going to keep doing this. Um, so I got to... I know we got a little bit of time, so I just got to just give a couple of thoughts about Kenny. Uh, Kenny, when Eleanor and I moved here in 1983, 35 years ago, which is hard to believe, uh, Kenny and Pam were among the first to really open their arms to us. And not only that, but Kenny, he really took a shine to the material that I had written before I moved to Nashville, before I was thinking about commerce, before I was thinking about what radio wanted to hear, what an A&R guy wanted to hear, I was just writing songs. And, but Kenny saw something in those tunes and uh, brought them to Keith Thomas. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just brings, it bears to mind that we, we all need each other, you know, and there's no one in this room who's done something by themselves. And so I really love the fact that, um, well, I, I, got, I have to mention Phil Kagi because Phil, Phil saw it first. Phil gave me my first, uh, my first opportunity, and I'll always remember that. So Kenny was the second, and I appreciate him. The one funny thing I got to say about Kenny is he was like the most particular person I've ever met. I mean, if I showed up in my car, which was a, which was a new Toyota pickup truck. I actually got mine before he got his, but his was just like mine. <laughs> but I would show up, you know, to write or something in my little red truck, and he would look at utter disdain at how filthy my car was. And one day he said, I want you to bring your truck over, and we're going to put the best Carnuba wax on it. You know, he just had this thing. So he was super detailed. And the other thing he was, was uh, he gave me the best advice in this business I've ever heard. And um, Lori Loving was the receptionist at Word at the time, at Word Day Spring, right? With Neil and Bubba and Randy and just a great crew of people over there, just lovely folks, all of whom welcomed me here. I'll never forget any of you. But when Kenny introduced me to Lori Loving, who remains a dear friend, um, he said, now look, Whenever you call like a record company, you make sure you know that receptionist's name. You won't, you know, and, and he really just reminded me that everyone at whatever level is a human being and is also a gatekeeper. You know, he, there was wisdom and, uh, you know, he was sharp about that stuff. One more thing and I'll let you go. This has to do with the phone. Kenny was like, had, had phone etiquette was like a huge deal to him. So one day he calls me up, and um, Eleanor and I had bought this little teeny house uh, actually across the street from Dennis Holt, who's back there. And uh, Dennis had told us about this house that we should check out, $45,000 in Sylvan Park. And so we scraped, but we really weren't making enough to, to just pay that $500 note every month. It just seems impossible now, doesn't it? But, um, so we had a friend of ours living with us, this guy from Rhode Island, where we were from, and he's back up there now. He didn't make it down here like the rest of us did. But anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, but Kenny one day, he uh, calls up, and I think the fellow that was living with us answers the phone, and, I, and it's for me, it's Kenny. So I get on the phone, and I'm like, hey, man. He goes, who is that answering your phone? And I said, well, it's, it's Dave. It's the guy that lives with us, and he goes, you know what he sounds like on the phone? And I'm like, uh, I, I guess. He goes, he answers the phone like this, hello. He said, that's not helping you, man. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, so he put it on me. Now I've got to have a conversation with this guy who's helping us pay our mortgage about how he's answered the phone. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I am so grateful to Kenny, and I'm grateful to you, Pam, too, because you were really part of welcoming me, and I remember you kids when you were just kids. Now you're old, too. But uh, uh, God bless him, you know, and uh, God bless each of you. Uh, 
I'm, I, I will just say I'm grateful, you know, and I think that's the attitude in this room is really all we can do is, is thank God for what we've been given and uh, the tools we've got to work with and the wonderful people he puts in our, in our path. So this is one Kenny and I wrote, and I, is this guitar going to come on? Do I need to plug it in? No, it's in. Oh, it's, it's me. My bad. Sorry. That's right. Thank you, Lori. See what I did? Lori Loving. I'm kidding. All right. Is this? Oh, okay. 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 Sorry, folks. All right. There we go. Thank you. So this song, I was practicing this morning. Kenny and I wrote this, and, and I realized, wow, this, this, is, uh, this song we wrote is about sex. So, uh... Like I said, I'm grateful. sleep last night from something that he said Johnny said he's leaving said he's never coming back again now it was back in Franklin High School where I first laid eyes on her a saucy little senior Jeannie gave his heart a stir Johnny wanted Jeannie more than any girl he'd ever had Now it was just another party where they made their rendezvous. Jeannie Johnny said, I've never met a girl like you. And when this party's over, do you think that I could drive you home? Oh, Jeannie had her questions when the romance had its start. But Johnny had the looks that shot an arrow through her heart. Before the night was over, Jeannie went and gave it all away. The party's over. Now it was fun while it lasted, but it ain't no fun no more. The party's over. And now they wonder what they hurried for. called up Johnny and she says, hey, I got bad news. Johnny said, don't worry, baby, I'll take care of you. They had a wedding party for their family and a few close friends. The party's over. It was fun while it lasted, but it ain't no fun no more. Party's over. Now they wonder what they hurried for. Now he used to say, I love you, till the marriage fell apart. Now he says, Hey, Jeannie, give me back my heart. And Jeannie's holding Junior, she says, Johnny. Thanks a lot. Yeah, well, cause Johnny's got his freedom and Jeannie's got the kids. Jeannie's always dreaming about the things she never did. Ain't it funny how infatuation fooled them in a playing house? Oh, the party's over. It was fun while it lasted. But it ain't no fun no more. The party's over. And now they wonder what they hurry for. The party's over. It was fun while it lasted. And it ain't no fun no more. The party's over. Now they wonder what 
they hurried for Oh, they wonder what they hurried for Thank you, Phil. Lesson learned, never follow Phil Madeira <laughs> with a eulogy. Yeah, I really believe Kenny would be digging this so far up to this point. My name is Bubba Smith. I produced four records on Kenny, his third, his fourth, fifth, and sixth recordings for Word Records. I also played drums in his road band, The Remarkables, after Doug Dimmel and Kenny surreptitiously fired me. But Kenny was also my friend. I'm currently on staff here at TVC as Director of Audiovisual, and I'm also full-time faculty, I'm a full-time faculty member at Middle Tennessee State University teaching music business in the recording industry. Yes, I'm an academic. And as a member of academia, one must establish the question before one can find the answer. So today's question is, who was Kenny Marks? At the academic's disposal for finding the answers to the question is research. Research involves developing an understanding of Kenny Marks through the examination and interpretation of evidence. And the evidence I used in answering the question, who was Kenny Marks? were his recordings, his songs, his videos, first-hand interviews, personal recollections, artifacts, and anecdotal evidence. The following are my findings. Kenneth, My Kenneth Michael Marks was born November 6, 1950, in Highland Park, Michigan, just six miles north of Detroit. His father, Michael, was a Yugoslavian immigrant, and Kenny's mom, Lucy, was a first-generation Yugoslav Michigander. Michael's original surname was Mrakovic, yet changed it to Marx after his and Lucy's firstborn, Karen, was born, and right before Kenny was born. Seven years later, Kenny's other sibling, Kathleen, was born. Michael Marx was a tool and die maker, and Lucy Marx was a homemaker. The Marx home was a loving and nurturing environment where church attendance and activities were a large part of the family, their house was filled with music as Lucy Marks sang and played the piano every day. And Kenny followed suit with classical piano studies and subsequently learned to play the piano, the guitar. He played the piano, the guitar. As for sports, Kenny and his dad shared the love of ice hockey as Kenny was a hustling hockey goalie. Kenny also luttered in tennis. Kenny attended Philadelphia College of the Bible as his pastor was an alumnus, and Kenny wanted to play soccer there. Also, PCB offered Kenny exposure and opportunities for their music ministries. It was at PCB that Kenny met then-evangelist Ross Rhodes, who chose Kenny and other fellow musicians, including the late George King, to travel with him on weekends for ministry outreach where they sang at churches and coffee houses. While performing at a Ross Rhodes concert in Charleston, West Virginia, Kenny was introduced to one Pam Childers. Pam was interested in attending a Christian college, and Kenny was still attending PCB, so Pam flew to Philadelphia for an interview with the administration of Philadelphia College of the Bible. Pam's interview didn't go too well, as she recalls, quote, Wearing hot pants to an interview <laughs> at an ultra-conservative Christian college probably wasn't the smartest move on my part. Yet I did get to spend the day with Kenny, so the airfare wasn't totally wasted, end quote. Things went south for Kenny and PCB as he was kicked out of college for dress code violations hair over his ears and collar, plus he wore boots. 
Shameful. Shameful. Kenny transferred to Messiah College with Pam enrolling there as well. And after Kenny's graduation from, from Messiah, he and Pam were eventually married in 1973. Kenny, with Pam in tow, had a performance in Pittsburgh and fell in love with the people and the Bohemian Christian culture they encountered and decided to start their marriage in Pittsburgh. After five years in Pittsburgh, they moved to the Nashville area so Kenny could pursue his dream of being a recording artist. And with setting down of roots, the beginnings of a family emerged with the birth of Allegra. The first time I met Allegra, was when Kenny, Pam, and Allegra came by the Word Office right up there at 2300 Hillsborough Road. Pleasantries were exchanged, and I tried to engage in conversation with a preschool Allegra. She, being shy and not saying anything, was asked by Kenny what she thought of Bubba. Allegra replied, quote, he should be put in jail, <laughs> end quote. And soon to follow was Sebastian, a rambunctious tot with a smile like his dad's who's grown to exhibit the same Yugoslav work ethic as his dad and grandfather. Allegra and Sebastian, your dad, told me on many occasions how proud he was of both of you and how much he loved you. Please know that. As Kenny had been performing for Billy Graham's Afterglow concert series, his solo performing dates were growing here in the States as well as England and Europe, and that Yugoslav work ethic caught the attention of record executive Neil Joseph. In 1981, Kenny was asked to participate in a recording project called Premier Performance on Murr Records, an affiliate label of Word Incorporated. The project was an album with songs by various unsigned artists and an invitation for buyers of the record to vote for their favorite artist who would then be offered a full recording contract with the Christian record label. Based on the buyer's responses and solid audio, radio airplay, Kenny Marks was officially offered a recording contract and became a word recording artist. His first two projects were produced by Keith Thomas under the watchful a and R I of label executive Neil Joseph. Kenny's third, fourth, fifth, and sixth recordings were produced by yours truly again under the watchful a and eye of label executive Neil Joseph and subsequently under Lynn Kiesecker. In describing his music, Kenny was quoted as saying, quote, my music is horizontal music. And what I mean by that is music that's face to face, person to person, but it's vertically connected with the love of Jesus, end quote. His lyrics spoke of relationship, hope, forgiveness, friendship, redemption, the stuff of real life. In looking back at Kenny's music career and songs, former manager, longtime friend and confidant, Randy Moore stated, quote, I really think he recognized his own weaknesses and shortcomings and tried to write songs that addressed them. He always wanted to be and do better, end quote. As his seventh project, Kenny went on to release a best of project and with lagging sales, his recording contract was not renewed. He did re record one more project of original material that was released on a word distributed label that gained little traction. With no record label, performance dates in decline, and a marriage that was over, Kenny had to find work. His former booking agent's father was rehabbing a building and needing someone to do manual labor, so Kenny was hired. He called me excited and asked me to come see his new place of employment. Kenny walked out to greet me dressed in overalls, a, a white t-shirt, work boots, a tool belt packed with tools, his hair pulled back in a ponytail with that million dollar grin and said, quote, isn't this place great? And don't I look like that guy Schneider on the TV series One Day at a Time? End quote. That building was the building we are in today. His jobs were many tearing down rotting drywall, cleaning, scrubbing, sanding the floors, collecting the rent from the tenants, and being a night watchman. In return, the owner, Charles Jones, gave Kenny a place to live. Right behind the balcony was a tiny apartment 
where Kenny lived and called home. His hiring here at the convent in 1997 was fortuitous in that he met a young lady. A young lady that had accidentally found herself locked in a woman's restroom as the door handle had broken off. Upon hearing the banging and yelling, Schneider, I'm Kenny, came to let her out with one condition. He let her out if she agreed to go on a date with him. She relented, he let her out, and five years later, they were married. And on top of that, Kenny adopted Wendy's daughter, Shelby, the same year they were married. And Shelby, I'll never forget when Kenny told me he was adopting you. The excitement in his voice was evident, and he was so proud of you, and he loved you so much. Around this time is when Kenny found a hobby, motorcycling. Wendy remembers, quote, I had bought Kenny lessons for certification and he was hooked immediately and started looking for a bike. He found it on eBay and had it shipped from Seattle and his passion for motorcycling was born, end quote. After doing his best Schneider impersonation at the convent, close friend Randy Moore came to Kenny with a, quote, now hiring, quote, end quote, advertisement cut out of the newspaper. Randy handed it to Kenny and said, quote, this job has got your name written all over it, end quote. Kenny went, he interviewed, and he got the job at Shop at Home as a television host. Kenny sold everything from autographed baseballs to exotic watches. He could do 30 minutes about the value and aesthetics of cubic zirconium without breaking a sweat. Unfortunately, with the stiff competition from QVC, HSN, and online giant Amazon, Shop at Home folded and Kenny found himself at BMW of Nashville and quickly became a top salesman. After a short stint at a financial firm, he then advanced to the local Audi Porsche dealership where he again became a top salesman and was the designated Porsche specialist. From exotic cars to trucks, Kenny had a brief run at FedEx as a driver and package delivery person during a Christmas season. And then the left coast came calling, where he ended up in Los Angeles as a pitch man for a music production company that created music branding packages for television shows. During a visit back to Nashville on February 4th, 2007 to be exact, Kenny suffered a major heart attack and almost died. And thank God subsequently had open heart surgery to repair the the uh, heart. Unfortunately, the initial heart attack caused such damage that he was working on half of a normal functioning heart for the rest of his life. As I'd had a similar event, Kenny was always asking me what my heart function was. I was fortunate in that my heart repaired itself to normal function. Quote, you do know that ejection fraction is usually measured only in the left ventricle, and a left ventricle ejection fraction of 55% or higher is considered normal. Well, I'm operating at 30%, pal, end quote. <laughs> Kenny dodged a bullet and was back up on his bike in no time making new friends in new vistas. His new favorite vista was Leaper's Fork with his new bike friends telling tall tales of his travel exploits to six of the world's seven continents and who knows what else. Tragedy would, be, would befall this son of an immigrant once again as Kenny had a terrible motorcycle accident on December 13th, 2015. This event was probably more physically and emotionally devastating than the heart episode as the recovery was slow and laborious. But like the phoenix that rose from its ashes, Kenny recovered and was back on his bike hanging out in Leaper's Fork pontificating about any and everything. So who was Kenny Marks? He was a world-traveling troubadour, singing about life and how Jesus could make a difference. He was all heart, a heart that was full of hope, a heart that was full of love, a heart full of optimism, yet his heart was damaged. 
and his heart just gave out on October 31st, 2018. It doesn't really seem real, does it? That your father, your brother, your uncle, your family, your lover, our friend is gone. Kenny loved us all big time, and in his own special way, spoken or unspoken. And with that big smile and teeth as white as chiclets, <laughs> let's listen and hear if Kenny checked everything off his to-do list before his last goodbye. Well, thank you all for coming on behalf of the family. They're so grateful for your attendance. And those of you watching at home and across the world, thank you. Thank you to TVC for opening up their home to all of us today and all those that put in so much effort. My tech crew up there, uh, my wife and daughter who were here greeting you. Um, the performers, Tom Hamby, Chris Rodriguez, Mark Cheshire, Phil Madeira, fantastic. Thank you for 
giving of your time and talent to honor our friend and your friend. Uh, the family, thank you so much for allowing us to do this and to uh, honor Kenny. Uh, two things, there are note cards out in the lobby. Write a little note to the family, a little memory something, leave it in the basket out there. And number two, the family's gonna stay up front for a few minutes, so feel free to come up and say hi, give them, uh, and give them, give them a hug. You're dismissed, thank you.